Yeah, welcome all back to the repartee. Four o'clock uh, hour here on a beautiful, beautiful. Uh, what is it today? Uh, Wednesday afternoon in, uh, in in Minneapolis. And uh, we are joined by a couple of good friends of mine. I'm super excited about this. Shane Claiborne and Michael Martin, who are touring the country right now in a bus driven by the uh, ever-talented uh, Katie Claiborne, uh, all across the country on a Beating Guns tour. And Beating Guns is, uh, gentlemen, if you give me a moment to explain to people what this is, it is in some ways a book. <laughs> It is in some ways a tour that you're uh, doing 40 cities in your in your bus. It's also soon to be a documentary film. But more than that, it's a it's a movement. It's a calling that uh, people would join in to do something about gun violence in this in this country. And all of that is coming right here to the Twin Cities on Friday, this Friday night uh, over at 31st in Chicago, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, you can go and meet uh, Shane and Michael and Katie and the whole gang. So, guys, thanks. Thanks for being with us. And tell us about uh, tell us about Beating Guns, the book subtitle Hope for People Who Are Weary of Violence. Yeah, heck yeah. We're we're halfway into a 37 city tour and. Of course, Minneapolis is our highlight of, well of played. it all. But well we're, uh, every city we go in, we're um, uh, transforming a gun into garden tools. And uh, that that's uh, Mike does all the work on that. He's a pastor and a blacksmith. Uh, but we're also amplifying voices of folks that have been impacted by gun violence, uh, survivors, family members, um, and, and trying to... to see some concrete action. So there's something powerful about in, you know, one and a half hours seeing a piece of metal go from a tool that was designed to kill into a tool that's designed to cultivate life. And uh, we see, we, we think we need the same kind of action when it comes to um, policies in our country, but uh, uh, that's what we're up to. It's been, been an incredible time. Yeah. And, and Mike, talk a bit about that. You're uh, you're a blacksmith and you you have a you carry, you're traveling with a forge and there's this I, what I've seen it happen. It's a wonderful in some ways it's a spectacle, but really it's kind of an emotional release when people who have been harmed by guns and have become the victims of violence that's brought to them by the end of a gun to see that gun melted down. And then turned into, uh, as Shane put it, a garden tool that could be used to cultivate life rather than to bring about death. There's something more than just the spectacle and kind of the sheer heat and power of melting and banging going on with that with that uh, transformation of the gun, huh? Yeah, there's Isaiah and Micah really knew what they were doing when they were talking about turning swords into plowshares. That uh, it's a lot more than that metal that's being transformed. When you see um, people who've been impacted, the other night we had somebody who. Uh, took the life of somebody else and he hit the barrel 18 times and at the end he said this is for my victim and that he had spent 18 years in prison and was now a youth pastor in that community and so there's a lot more transformation going on there than just that metal but it's also an opportunity for the community to witness uh, mm. the trauma that people who go through gun violence have and still carry um, and just be able to be there in solidarity with them and support them um, because it's it is about the triggers in our streets. It's also about the triggers in our hearts. And for some reason, that anvil kind of welcomes both of those there. And it's really a holy space. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. And I was with you guys when we were in uh, Philadelphia at a demand the ban, which was specifically asking for the banning of the legal sale and distribution of assault weapons. And um, a lot of times the political side and the policy side of this turns to the most violent of weapons, but more deaths and more violence is uh, distributed through guns that come in the handgun version of this. Uh, is, is that part of your conversation here is not just to uh, move legislation or move uh, public opinion on assault rifles, but actually to affect how people think about uh, the use of handguns. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's, there's, what we say is we're not here to prescribe uh, one answer, but to provoke people's hearts to want to take action. Um, but there are, you know, there's things like handguns where we've, we've uh, had a lot of states that want to pass a limit to the number of handguns that one person can have. It's often called one handgun a month bill that would <laughs> limit the handguns to 12 that one person could purchase in a year. <laughs> wow. you go, well, that makes sense. But those block those laws keep getting blocked over and over by a very small minority 
of kind of gun extremists, whereas 90 percent of Americans, over 80 percent of gun owners want to see some real changes. So handguns are absolutely a huge problem. Um, And so are stolen guns. We have a gun stolen about every minute in the U.S. And in a lot of places, uh, stolen guns don't even have to be reported. Um, so things like that, domestic abusers being able to have access to guns. Uh, if you're on a no fly list, maybe you should be on a no gun list. You know, there's, there's those th- things. Um, but you know, on the other hand, like Mike said, it's not just about legislation. You can't criminalize hatred and it'll still find different forms. So that's why we, we, when we go to the forge, we say we, we have a gun problem and a heart problem mm-hmm. and, uh, God heals hearts and people change laws and we need both. So when if people want, want to make it out, on the, uh, that's this Friday night, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. It's a public event. Uh, it's being held over at Mount Olive Church, uh, Lutheran Church, on 31st in Chicago in South Minneapolis. Uh, when, when, when they come that night, uh, what will they experience? What are you going to do um, if people you know, don't know anything about blacksmithing? Uh, is this still something for them if they're not particularly religious? And the metaphor from the from the, the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament saying, you know, let's let's pound the swords into um, into plowshares. Uh, that metaphor is maybe not the thing that organizes them. So if they're religious or not religious into blacksmithing or not, what, what are they going to experience on Friday night, uh, six o'clock to eight o'clock over at Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 31st in Chicago? Well, every every place we go, we invite a lot of local people to who are on the ground doing the work to uh, participate in our events that can be artists or musicians or people who have been directly affected by gun violence. So they're going to, they're going to show up to an event that is very uh, relatable to their community, but also they're going to see it's accessible beyond while well, Shane and I are both Christians that, uh, and we have that voice. It's, we're not preaching at people. So it's a really accessible place to, to be involved with your community and hear the stories of gun violence that are impacting mm. Minneapolis. Yeah. It's like a 90 minute event that includes art and music. And one of, uh, my heroes right there in Minneapolis, uh, Mary Johnson Roy, yes. uh, who lost her son and has now started an organization along with uh, the young man and his mother who took her son's life. And so they're they're trying to do restorative justice and meet with people on both sides of gun violence because it's uh, it's it's affecting both the, the people who lose their children and also those who uh uh, maybe their kids have taken someone's life and they end up uh, spending most of their life in prison. So Mary's going to share her story and uh, it's going to be an incredible night. Yeah. And, and I've, I've been to some of these events that you guys have put on and I'll just say that for people who are gun advocates and gun supporters, um, I think you guys do a really great job of not demonizing people who are hunters or who think about, you know, weapons that have been passed down from their families and are sort of kept in that way. And you, I mean, I just think you guys do a fine job of representing all of that. And and it's also, um, even though there's all this sadness in the air because, um, it's, you know, whether it's gun violence that people are turning on themselves and suicide, which is the number one means of people killing themselves in this country or killing one another, um, by, by, uh, uh, intention or accidentally, um, it's just riddled with sadness across the whole thing. There's a sense that you guys uh, can bring some real hope in the midst of that, uh, of those sad, uh, of those sad moments. Do you want to say a little bit about that, about how you balance or how you walk this careful line of having people, you know, knowing that guns are an important part of a lot of people's imagination in this country and yet gun violence sure. is something you're bringing into and how you bring hope in the midst of all this. Yeah, well, the, 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 there's, you know, it was intentional that our subtitle is hope for people who are weary of violence. Cause we very, we very much realize that some people are coming to uh, events like what we'll do in Minneapolis with a very heavy heart, you know, um, uh, some that, that feel just, you know, that, that fatigue of another mass shooting, another kid killed on our corner. Um, but there's, there's folks that really are, are clinging to the hope. And we're really hopeful because we see young people that are rising up all over this country from Parkland students to the Black Lives Matter movement. We see, um, what happened in New Zealand, a terrible tragedy. And for several nights, we began by beating on the gun 50 times for the lives mm-hmm. lost in New Zealand. But then day, within days, we saw a country rise to the occasion mm. and make substantial changes and, and also take on the hatred and the racism and Islamophobia. So um, 
you know, I think that when, when we look at what is normal right now, there's a lot of folks going, it doesn't need to be normal to lose 105 lives every day to guns through suicide, homicide, accidental deaths. Like that doesn't need to be normal. It's not normal in any mm-hmm. other industrialized mm-hmm. country in the world. So um, we are hopeful and we, we do believe that change is coming and uh, people will feel that hope on Friday night. So I'm talking to Shane Claiborne, Michael Martin. They've uh, conspired together on a book called Beating Guns, Hope for People Who Are Weary of Violence, which, man, aren't we all? Um, and uh, But there's also this tour event that's happening. They're coming uh, this Friday to Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 31st in Chicago. Really encourage you to get out for this. Uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a great time. Kids are welcome. I, I know that to be true. Adults are welcome. No matter where you are on the spectrum of this on Friday night, it's a great, it's a great way to spend, spend time. Can you guys say something about the, the documentary that's, uh, that's going to be released? I think that's, isn't that happening in the next couple of weeks, uh, a documentary about gun violence that you're part of? Yeah, that it's uh, by our friend Rex Harson. He put out this documentary, and it, it's being released on 420, which is the 20th anniversary of Columbine. Mm, that's right. Um, the, and our our tour kind of started through Lent, and it's kind of ending there on on that Holy Saturday. So he did a great job of getting a lot of different voices. There's a lot of new content in that documentary that isn't in the book. So it, I'd really encourage you to uh, reach out to Rex, and we'll have info at the event on how you can do that. And he could he'd be happy to get people involved in, in hosting a screening or, or getting them to access it. Yeah, it's all on our website, beatingguns.com. We'll have more information. But, I mean, it is it is wrenching that the 20th anniversary of Columbine falls on the same weekend as Easter. And that's part of why Rex wanted to release the film because, you know, we live in a world that it just feels like constantly life and death are – are um, uh, battling each other. And, and yeah, as a Christian, we, we believe that, you know, life does get the last word. Love yeah. does get the last word, but it doesn't always feel like, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like we're still living in Good Friday before the resurrection. So uh, this kind of honors all of that pain. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that, guys. And, and you all being out there, you know, the 20th anniversary this month of uh, the Columbine shooting is just matched by all the shootings before that. And um, you know, what, what happened at Sandy Hook and just, you know, sometimes we can get confused by all the mass shootings and then also forget about all the individual killings that happen. And, and I'm with you. You know, I think that love does get the last word and life gets the last word. But, boy, sometimes it feels like it's stuttering a bit, doesn't it? And it's just can't quite <laughs> yeah. can't, can't quite get the word out. And so you guys being out there, um, you know, trying to. Trying, trying to draw those words out, uh, I think really means a lot. So uh, I, I appreciate your good work, all the goodness that you're doing. Tonight you're in Missouri, right, on the hap chance that somebody's uh, watching this online or listening. Tell us where you're going to be tonight, and I'll remind people that on Friday night you're going to be at 31st in Chicago here in South Minneapolis, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. But where, yeah, where are absolutely. you tonight? We're, we're about an, a mile from the Capitol uh, here in Jefferson City. Uh, we're at Quinn Chapel AME Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church. And, uh, you know, what's been incredible is we've been in parks, community centers, street corners. And so tonight we're in uh, Quinn Chapel AME, uh, 630 to 830. And uh, all of the events have their own unique bright, bright page. So folks mm-hmm. that might be listening in other cities can uh uh, just go to beatingguns.com and you'll see uh, all the cities. We've got about 20 or so cities left. So, uh, yeah, thanks, man. Good yeah. to talk to you. Yeah, beatingguns.com. Uh, uh, f- find all the details over there. Come see these guys on Friday night. And, gentlemen, I will see you on Saturday in New York City. So, uh, hey, uh, thanks uh, th- thanks for all the good you're doing. Stick with us here on the Minnesota Progressive Repartee on AM 950, Progressive Voice of Minnesota. Back after the break. Yeah, welcome back, all. Uh, glad to have you with us here on this uh, beautiful Wednesday. Uh, man, it's a spring day out there. Really feels, really feels top of the world. Uh, really feels great. Hey, I do want to just add one more encouragement for you all to get out there and join those guys uh, on Friday night. It's uh, it's it's worthwhile. Uh, Beating guns dot com. You know, if you're if we're going to change the legislation, if we're going to change the laws, you have to be willing to uh, change people's ideas on this. And a lot, cause a lot of people, uh, they just disagree on, uh, on guns. I, I find myself in a, in a, in a bit of a, a lonely extremist position. You know, I think uh, we should change the second amendment to clarify that it was talking about um, state militias and not talking about uh, individuals carrying weapons. And uh, I think we should have moratorium on the sale of, of bullets and of all things around guns. So I, I, I know I'm, I'm in that camp. Uh, a lot of other people aren't though. Um, and, uh, I'm not going to try to win everyone, everyone over to that camp, but I would like for people to at least stop the violence 
and pass any laws that we need to to stop the violence that's so deeply associated with guns. So, uh, And what those guys are doing, Michael and Shane Claiborne, is really worth it. So I encourage you to get out there, uh, beatingguns.com. Hey, uh, Brad and Robbinsdale, you've got, uh, I, I see on the, uh, on the little screener thing here, you said uh, Trump's stupid statements. Man, I, I just, I can't get over uh, how many there are and how rapidly they're coming. But uh, uh, what, what are your thoughts on the, uh, on the fine president's uh, statements? Okay, well, while listen, you know, listening to you on the radio here, Doug, I've you know again discovered that you are a very well educated and well read individual. But have you ever read Charles Darwin's Oranges of the Species? <laughs> I have not read his Oranges of the Species. But last <laughs> night when I heard the president, I was thinking, man, I could go for a great orange. I was, it kind of turned up my orange interest. Uh, oh, if you don't know what, uh, what Brad uh, from Robinsdale was referring to there is that yesterday president Trump was, uh, lambasting the, uh, the special counsel, um, appointment and trying to say what we need to look into, according to the president of the United States is the rationale behind how did this whole thing start how did how did this investigation get itself going what what first led to the fbi looking at all this and the president's idea is that it came from what's often referred to as the steel dossier put together by someone who was hired first by republicans and then funded by the clinton campaign and then the uh on called oppo research and that that uh, information then was passed on to the fbi because what was found in that research was so devastating well, Trump is trying to say that information is what caused all of this Mueller thing to start that sent us down the bad road. So what we need to do is get back to the origins and find out. But he couldn't say the word origins, and he kept saying the word oranges. Did you hear it, Brett? I, I didn't hear that. But I just want to go back to what you said, because it wasn't the Steele dossier that I started know. the investigation. And what's funny is, so on Fox News, I heard this on the David Pakman show. Uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Chris Wallace, I think, one yeah. of the Fox mm-hmm. anchors. Mm-hmm made just a very generic statement saying, no, that actually wasn't yes. true. And apparently he's just getting all sorts of heat from Fox viewers and Fox anchors for just making a very bland statement saying, well, it actually didn't start with the... Uh, yeah, he said, sorry, listeners, sorry, viewers. The investigation into the president's uh, participation with Russia did not come from, was not rooted from its origins, nor its oranges, did, its not, oranges. did not come from uh, the Steele dossier, which is super important for people, right? Like, OK, because in all honesty, if that's where it had come from, that would have seemed a little bizarre. I think we all would have had some questions to ask. I do think the president is right about this. And I don't think I've said that sentence very often. I'm, in fact, I'm going to go into a, a rant here after the break about um, his terrible treatment of people in uh, Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras. And I take that one a little personally. I have friends in both those countries, and I've spent a lot of time in my life working with people in both those countries. And the thought that the president of the United States is going to take money from them because he wants to punish people that are seeking asylum is just it's just immoral and disgusting. So I don't say this very often that the president was right about something. But what he is right about is we should look at the origins again. He because I think he's having some, oranges. I think he's having I really do think he's having some issues of of some brain function. Uh, I don't know that I I don't know if enough about dementia, but his inability to remember words and to speak them properly is really catching up. Maybe it's just sleep deprivation. Maybe it's a whole lot of stress and other pressures, but the number of times, and because he's Donald Trump, he just doubles down on the word and acts as if it's the right word to say. But if you could go and watch on the internet, him trying to say, we need to get to the origins of this. And he can't remember the word origins and is saying the word oranges and then knows that he's saying the word oranges. It really sounds like someone who's having a you know, like uh, like verbal slurs that come from a lack of brain function. But all that to say, the origins is what we should look at, which is why were you colluding with the Russians in so many ways, right? I totally agree that we should look at the origins of what caused this investigation. And that was all the people in your campaign that were tied in with the Russians for the love of it all. You know how it got started? You looked at the camera and said, Russia, if you're listening release those emails. That's how it got, you know, how it got started is that Roger Stone was telling people that he was in touch with Julius, Julian Assange from WikiLeaks. Like, of course there were reasons why it came together. And, and um, as you say, Mike Wallace on Fox news, who's who's a fine newsman himself, right? Like as it turns out, Hey, did you hear that? um, 
uh, who's the who's the 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 um, woman that's the commentator? Uh, she was the head of the DNC after. Um, oh, uh, she was after Wasserman Schultz, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Um, oh, I just Donna Brazil. Donna Brazil. She's now a Fox News uh, like commentator. Did you see this? He's really going. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you know they're trying to. They try. To, they actually like. Look, I have nothing positive to say about the industry that is Fox News. It's 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 just you know it is what it is. But they actually do have a whole number of people over there. And I will just say this: there are more times where on Fox News they say things that are just straight up newsworthy and counter the Trump administration than you ever get on some of the other channels that are more anti-Trump and spend their time talking about how. Uh, the, the Trump administration is is detrimental to the country. I don't blame those other networks for doing that or for this radio station for doing that because there's so much that the Trump administration is doing that's damaging. Full-time effort on that is demanded and needed, and I'm all for it. But over at Fox, there's a number of reporters and there's a number of news people straight up that are countering the very message. So uh, the, 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 the Trump cult runs so deep that they can even fend off the uh, Shepard Smiths at times, the right. the Mike Wallaces, the Donna Brazils. It's incredible uh, how deeply rooted the hypnosis like experience of people that continue to support uh, the Trump administration runs and is. It's just really, it's really something. But but I do think Brad's on to something here about the um, about the commentary uh, of uh, the president not being able to frame the word orange. Or not being able to phrase the word origin and getting stuck with oranges. It's it's worth a Google search. It's really um, it's it's quite. It, and when you see it in light of all the other things he's talking about in that same press uh, 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 little experience that he has, you realize he, his mind is he's just saying things that are insane. Like wind power causes cancer. The sound from wind causes cancer, and that the Guatemalan government is putting, selecting the worst people and putting them in caravans and sending them here. Like, it's just, it's so irrational. It's, it's incredible. All right. It's uh, just basically your grandpa on Facebook. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's unfortunately that's kind of, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I just think about my, uh, my grandchildren looking at me and saying, no, I literally have a grandfather on Facebook. It's, it's me. So let's, let's be nice to the grandfathers on Facebook too. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You. <laughs> hey, uh, okay. AM nine fifty, Progressive Voice of Minnesota, and this is the afternoon rep. Our table. We'll be back after the break. Uh, who's the trucker with the bumper? I like it. He, he called yesterday, uh, David the trucker. Yeah, yeah. One of our listeners out on the road trucking around and listening online to AM nine fifty. David the trucker. I love it. One, one one of the things I just the reason I love this radio station, love radio, and I just think you can you can have. Uh, you can enter into a whole other kind of conversation when you're talking to people in their trucks. I just think it's one of the things that uh, progressive democratic ideas don't get out there enough. They don't, uh, they don't get into the flow because they, uh, they miss the cab of the truck, whether that's a pickup truck or uh, you know, a little SUV or one of the big rollers. Uh, it just, uh, it's a place you gotta, you gotta engage in the conversation. So appreciate uh, trucker David. That's awesome. Hey, and, and that news for that weather forecast there, uh, boy, 66 on Saturday. Hang in there, everybody. It's, uh, it's, about to, it's about to turn the corner. It's fantastic. I'm going to New York tomorrow. I'm going to be in New York for a couple of days. And um, the, rain, the, the schedule or the forecast is scheduled to be uh, rain in 42 and windy in New York. So I'm going to be, uh, it's not very often that you look back and say, boy, I'd much rather be in Minneapolis on this day in April, but uh, that's going to be, that's going to be one of those. Hey, uh, Brett, you may have seen this, that, uh, that Donald Trump went on one of his tenter tantrum, temper tantrums the other day. I watched the video footage of him standing. I think he was somewhere in Florida because uh, Marco Rubio was standing behind him, um, looking at the ground, shuffling his feet, uh, like, in, like he's in some, you know, uh, some, some junior higher sitting in the uh, principal's office. Uh, getting in trouble and uh, uh, sort of shifting side to side while Donald Trump rages on about uh, his plans to cut back on aid that's being sent to Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras. Now, uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, when there in 2014, when there was a big influx of people coming to the U.S. seeking asylum from Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras, the Obama administration made the decision to do what they said, what they refer to as to influence the push factors, 
What they mean by this is the push factors are those things that are in the countries of people's origin that are causing them to leave and pushing them out of the country. Drugs, crime, uh, lack of work, uh, government instability, these kinds of things are what cause people to start walking from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala through Mexico to try maybe hook, hook up with a ride to come up to the border of the U.S. and Mexico and try to ask for asylum because they're under the kinds of pressure that our government has long said earns someone the right to enter this country and be supported by the care and the good people of this country when you're in such a difficult situation and you can come in seeking some sort of refugee asylum. And we good people in Minnesota know that because, you know, we have the highest percentage of uh, refugees per capita in the state, in the, in the country, our state, Minnesota does it better than anybody else. So we understand this. So they come to the, to, to the border. Well, the Obama administration wanted to fund the push fund, uh, to help to address the push factors. Some people say that there's a pull factor, which is that the United States has the job. So that's pulling people this direction. So if you sort of get that, that metaphor, well, of course the Trump, uh, because he's just, just is so, uh, haunted by the success of Barack Obama, everything Obama did, he just finds some way to undo it. Just, just sheerly just goes around and like, he'll just try to wipe out everything that anybody, uh, associated uh, with the Trump campaign, the Trump administration ever suggests would be anti Obama. He's glad to do it. So, they want to cut aid, $520 million, down from $750 million. Now, just think about this for a minute. $500 million divided by three countries. That is such a small amount of money. Donald Trump spent $100 million on the parties for his own inauguration. Think about that for a minute. This joker spends a hundred million dollars on parties and then says, I think I'm going to cut a hundred and fifty million dollars of support and aid to El Salvador. As if a hundred and fifty million dollars is anywhere near enough to deal with all the issues. He should be doubling and tripling the money. So first of all, his just sheer pettiness is unbelievable, but then his ability to undo one good thing that happens in this world, which is the U.S. through U.S. aid stepping up its support for things that in the international world are called NGOs, non-government organizations. In the United States, we refer to those as non-profit organizations. So if you hear someone talking about an NGO in a country, it's the same thing about in the U.S. we would call a non-profit, meaning it's an organization of which someone doesn't own, but it's also not the government, and it's it exists for the benefit of someone else other than the people who own and operate that enterprise. So this money... That goes to NGOs in, in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras doesn't go to the government. It's not like government officials are putting money in their pockets. I think Donald Trump literally thinks that everybody runs the governments in their country the way he runs the government here, that he thinks, well, if I'm the president, then I'm just going to make some money off this thing at my golf courses or at my hotel. Well, that's not actually the way it works in most countries. It wasn't the way it used to work in the U.S., the money that the United States gives to Guatemala is earmarked, targeted, demanded to have to go to nonprofit, non-government organizations who work specifically to address issues of poverty, corruption, and support for people so that they can create the conditions by which people will stay in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador and not seek refugee status. So the very idea that what Donald Trump wants to do is to punish those countries because their people are leaving by taking away the money that goes to make it possible for them to stay in those countries is just the kind of thinking that goes on inside of Donald Trump's head and comes out of his mouth on such a regular basis. It's almost difficult to even express why it's such a bad idea. In all honesty, trying to explain to people 
why it's a bad idea, you first have to explain this way of thinking. And people look at you as they have to me over the last three or four days, like I'm crazy. Like I'm making up a story about what Donald Trump is saying he wants to do, but this is exactly what he wants to do. And then he frames it in. We're going to take the money from their government because they haven't done anything for us. Again, this idea that everything the United States does is in some kind of a short-term petty transactional process by which we're going to give them uh, $200 million and what are we going to get for it? What you're going to get for it is a more stabilized society over time so that people in Central America can have a life there of which fleeing their country is not the best option. Just think about for a minute how bad life must be in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras for people, mothers of children, to leave their country on foot and walk a thousand or more miles to get to another country for the love. They're fleeing something. Look, life in America is not that great that you're going to try to get here with all of that risk and all of that pain. If you weren't fleeing something, they're fleeing gangs and they're fleeing violence. So what we should be doing is doubling down. Now, look, I've spent a lot of time in Guatemala. I've been going there for more than almost 30 years. I spent time in El Salvador. I know people who do these works. I've seen US aid work on the ground in El Salvador and in Guatemala. It's incredible. What's done with 150 and 200 million dollars? Simply incredible. Should it be half a million, half a billion dollars? Absolutely. Should that money be coming from more places? For sure it should. Does Central America have to figure out how to have governmental reforms and police reforms and violence reforms? Yes. Do they probably need to figure out something more like the European Union for all of Central and South America, where there could be more like one centralized governmental apparatus for all of these places for sure the country of guatemala is like five million people it's like taking wisconsin minnesota south dakota and iowa and turning us all into separate nations now i know some people in the south would like to do that with their states that they really want to break up the union but for most of us we benefit from only having to run a state and not having to run an entire federal apparatus in these countries they're small They have a small population and they're incredibly divided and poverty's high. So trying to take a five or 7 million person population or 10 million person population and run an entire nation off of that, it's extremely hard. They have their own currency. They have their own trade deals. It doesn't make any sense at all. I've been a long-term 30-year advocate for, I have to find another way to organize these countries for sure. But the United States should be doing something exactly opposite of what Donald Trump is saying. All right, if you want to talk about that, you can give us a call, 952-946-6205. We'll be back after the break, AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota, and the afternoon repartee. Hey, welcome back to the repartee. Doug Padgett in today. It's uh, it's a Wednesday. I'm often here on uh, Wednesdays. Um, and Hunter on Thursdays, Brett on Friday. Well, Brett, you're you're around all the time. You're like the uh, you're you're the voice that's uh, that's as consistent as I, anything. You're like the voice I, of God I'm here. I'm everywhere. Right? Yes, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> everywhere. You're right inside people's heads. Well, we like to have all these voices here. And we'll, in fact, uh, let's chat with Stan in Minnetonka. Let's say a little something about AIDS Central America. Hey, Stan, thanks for your call today, and thanks for listening. Hey, I tell you what, uh, just quickly, we uh, we may have screwed up Syria pretty bad, but now the Russians are there, and Venezuela's, you know, pretty screwed up, and I don't know how much we had to do with that, but now the Russians are there. So if we want to pull the aid out of those three countries that, mm. you know, most of those people are coming from, you know, who are coming over the border, mm. uh, then it'll probably be the Russians or the Chinese that move in there, and I'm not so sure that's what we want. Boy, Stan, that is a that is a really thoughtful comment. That um, very often, what happens in international affairs, because countries know that you know we're we're all we're all deeply connected to each other. And if the U.S. pulls out, and look, the U.S. has had a really negative experience in Central America. I've been going there for thirty years when there was still a, a kind of a, almost a covert civil war going on uh, in, in Guatemala, and the the CIA has been involved in some really bad stuff over the decades in Central America. And if we don't do the right thing, like you're saying, and invest and care and be uh, be neighbors in what how, how the Bush administration used to put it in the neighborhood, 
if you don't live well with those that are even on your own in your own hemisphere, um, it really seems like it's advocate advocate. Boy, I'm having a Trump moment. It really seems like it's giving up the uh, experience that the U.S. should be having in these countries. Yeah. Do you, Do you have any experience in well, Guatemala, no, El Salvador, Honduras, anything like that yourself, or do you do you follow that that particular? No, I, I really don't travel that much out of this country. I just I'm single, and I just like enjoy traveling yeah. in this country. Yeah. If I had somebody, you know, a, a significant other, just real quickly, I would like to say that uh, Africa's the same thing. You yeah. know, we're we're basically thumbing our nose at the Africans, calling them the asshole countries totally. and whatever. And and the uh, the Russians and the Chinese are just kind of moving in and helping themselves. So we we are what we are. Stan, I think that's really, really a good thought. Thanks. Thanks for your call. I, I've been talking to a lot of Trump supporters for a long time about why they support Trump. And what you just tapped at there, Stan, is exactly what they say. That is a stance that many people that I know who support Trump and his in the administration this is what they've wanted for a long time. It's a version, a version of isolationism. There's people on all sides of the of the political right and left spectrum that would like for the U.S. to have a much smaller footprint in the world. And there's some good arguments for that. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fodder for good conversation about that, what the role of the U.S. should be all around the world. But there's a lot of Trump supporters who, when they hear that we're going to pull out aid and everything else, it's not only it's not because they don't even get to the point of thinking about is it mean or not? Is it cruel? They just get to the point that the U.S. should just mind our own business and should just be us. And I want to argue uh, every chance possible that ship has sailed. The United States is engaged with interests all over the world. And if we don't care for those interests, we become like people that adopted a puppy and are just letting them run wild. And it's not what anybody wants. Now, if we want to renegotiate our relationship with these other countries, if we want to renegotiate the care of that puppy in that in that metaphor, then we should do that. But you don't just cut the leash and say, go be on your own and go for a run. That's the conversation we have to have. And I wish the Trump administration had said that's the conversation we want to have. Instead, it's just this random stuff. As it turns out now, he's not even going to do it. He's not even going to cut the aid because he just says this stuff and makes uh, people like me just lose our absolute mind. Okay, one more comment here from David, and then I'm going to get to uh, to Mark and Fridley and Gary. Hey, hey, David, you have some thoughts about aid to Central America as well? Yeah, you know, you, you made some really good points, and it, it made me think, you know, there's, you know, I don't know the answer to this, but sometimes I, I get the feeling that when we help, quote-unquote, help these other countries, that, that we're not really helping, we're just prolonging things. I've always been a strong believer in self-governance, and I just feel like sometimes when we when we step in and interfere, we're making it a lot worse. And maybe some of these countries would be better off if we just weren't there. Yeah, it's a it's a good conversation. I mean, I've spent time uh, in those places, and I'll tell you, it's uh, there's days where I've certainly felt that way. Like maybe it's better we're not there. Uh, but I think there's a way to be there that is better than other ways of being there. And in my view, it's certainly better than not being there. At least in the I, countries I in there's, central. There's, there's... Go ahead. I, I agree that there's 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 definitely a better way, but I mean, it's because of us that the that the term banana republic even exists, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, because of our our desire desire for bananas. But no, you're you're right. It's it's exactly that that it's and and that's part of the issue, right? That there's a big economic driving force and there's a big social force that that makes this happen. What what just I mean, partly because I have a lot of personal connection in in Central America, and I just know how vulnerable those countries have been for 150 years and we this is not the point at which the u.s just says we just want out that you you don't go this far down the road over the last hundred years and then all of a sudden decide to just pull out we may want to renegotiate that and i would appreciate any president who has a foreign policy that would want to renegotiate relationships with these with these countries but uh, just pulling out isn't one of them but david thanks so much for your, for your call hey mark uh, and friendly sorry to keep you keep you waiting so long uh, sorry about that my friend hey mark no that's okay and i would recommend a stand i'm assuming you've read it um and david um Please, I beg you, please read the book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, mm. which goes into detail specifically what are for, and David hit the nail on the head. We've been doing this since the, 
since the 1800s. Right. And when you're talking about the CIA involvement and NGOs and USAID, you have to add another acronym, which is NOC, N-O-C, mm. for non-official cover, which is CIA lingo. <laughs> right. um, it's been a lot of that in Central um, America. Uh, absolutely. And, and you know, if you read the article about Venezuela in, in the uh, uh, Sunday paper and the Star Tribune that came out of McClatchy, it was nothing other than pure propaganda. Mm. It's not, you know, drugs are the problem, violence is the problem, but you know what the problem is? It's been that we are strangling these countries with economic and banking sanctions so we can overthrow what they're referring to as a leftist dictator. Leftist is a progressive dictator. We've been messing with Venezuela since Hugo Chavez and long before, and we're still not happy with that. China and Russia are filling in the void. They're bringing in aid, support, right. uh, uh, health care. Um, those are things we should do. But we, we need to also ask, how does a country that's trillions of dollars in debt give out billions of dollars in financial aid to other countries? <laughs> Well, and that well, financial yeah, aid goes yeah, that's, to the tops. Yeah, that's that's well. Yeah, it, okay. It, it, in in this case, the money that goes to Central America uh, through this program that that Trump wants to cut that Obama initiated uh, doesn't actually go to the tops. In this case, it goes to the NGOs. But uh, we can talk about that more. Sorry, everybody. Uh, sorry, Gary. We, we ran out of time here today. Uh, AM nine fifty, Progressive Voice of Minnesota, in your afternoon repartee. We'll be back tomorrow with Brett.